at the end for for questions. So with that, let's get us uh, started. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to our webinar on the new EPM, EPA PM 2.5 standard and its implications for regulatory monitoring and scientific communities. My name is uh, Dan Ruth and I'll be your host and QA moderator today, um, along with uh, my Sonoma Technology colleague, Olivia Ryder. Um, she'll help me with questions at the end with our Q&A panel. Uh, as, many as, as many of you are aware, the EPA's recent strengthening of the primary annual PM 2.5 standard from 12 to 9 micrograms uh, per meter cubed is intended to further protect the public from the negative health impacts of particle pollution. Uh, subsequently, it is more important than ever to understand the composition of PM 2.5 and the methods to measure it uh, in order to develop strategies for management, reduction, and compliance, and ultimately to ensure this new rule achieves its public health objectives. Uh, to help us understand the implications of this new rule better, we have an excellent panel of speakers today. Uh, they include uh, Lindsay Wickersham, uh, the State Implement Implementation Plan Specialist from US EPA Region 9, uh, she's also joined by uh, Rory Mays, um, Acting Manager of Geographic Strategies and Modeling Section um, for the Air and Radiation Division at EPA Region 9. Um, he'll be joining us uh, just at the end um, for uh, the, the panelist discussion um, and to answer any questions you might have. Uh, next, we have Hillary Hafner, um, our COO here at Sonoma Technology. Uh, then uh, Crystal McClure, one of our atmospheric scientists here. And then lastly, Ryan Moffitt, uh, the Department Manager of Advanced Air Measurements here. A uh, quick rundown of our agenda. Uh, Lindsay will start us off with some background on the new standard. Uh, this will be followed by Hillary giving us a slice of history on PM 2.5. Next will be Crystal discussing uh, the impact of wildland uh, fire smoke on exceptional events. And then finally, Ryan will uh, get more into the science of it all um, with a discussion on aerosol chemical and physical properties. Uh, then at the end of the hour, hopefully we'll be roughly on time here. So around noon or a little bit afterwards, uh, we'll begin our Q&A and that's open to all panelists and attendees. Again, feel free to um, type in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, or alternatively, once the Q&A panel begins, uh, please just raise your hands um, and I'll go ahead and unmute you. And with that, uh, I will now hand it off to Lindsay. Okay, Lindsay, take it away. I had a, a note from Lindsay just a moment ago that her Zoom crashed and or um, the sound went out, so it should be coming back in a moment here. Okay. If it's if it's all right, maybe we could wait just a, a few seconds, um, sure. such that she's able to rejoin with audio. Okay. Um, it's not a true webinar unless we have some sort of technical difficulty. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. If you like, Dan, I could start on the first uh, couple of slides. Um, on Lindsay's behalf, and uh, hopefully she is able to reconnect. We just don't want to, I, I see at least one other person is kind of reconnecting to audio. So would you like me to, to do so? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I guess, um, well, thank you all for for uh, joining. Um, we're, we're happy to share some information on the 2024 PM 2.5 NACS revision and designations. Um, Lindsay, as well as one of our other colleagues, Ashley Graham, are our staff leads on the designations process that'll be rolling out over the next couple of years. Um, I think at the end of the slide presentation, Lindsay's included her contact info. But with that, we could probably um, advance to the next slide. I'm not quite sure whether how to do so in Zoom. You can just go ahead and click. Um, Should be good to go. There we go. Okay. So. Um, and I, I think probably much of this, um, some of this information will be familiar with folks. So on February 7th of this year, um, we did revise the primary annual PM 2.5 NAX, strengthening it from 12.0 micrograms to 9.0 micrograms per meter cubed. 
Um, among other changes were some revisions to their quality index. Maybe that's a particular note given all of our interests in wildfire and also to some of the monitoring requirements. Um, among other things, there was one bit kind of capturing um, yeah, heightened exposure and needing to capture those. Uh, we did not change a number of the other pieces of the NACs, including the secondary welfare-based standards, um, the 24-hour PM 2.5 standards, and also the PM 10 standards. So those kind of remain in effect and un unrevised as of this revision. You can see our administrator, uh, Regan, in the bottom right there. So um, as with any um, uh, kind of the periodic review of the NACs, um, EPA reviews the extensive scientific record, the recommendations from our Clean Air Act Scientific Advisory Committee, and the public's input. You know, there's the proposed rule and final rule process for that. Um, based on the available evidence and technical information out there, um, the prior NACs, so that 12 microgram standard did not protect public health within an adequate margin of safety as required by the Clean Air Act. So among other things, as part of the final NACs, um, and there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of, a wealth of fact sheets and other information on our EPA websites. We expect the health benefits of this NACs would include up to 4,500 avoided premature deaths, um, many fewer cases of asthma, and also many fewer lost work days. These are all estimated as of 2032, kind of further along the implementation of this NACs. I'm just gonna pause here and see if um, by chance, Lindsay has been able to regain audio and video. Dan, I'm not seeing her. Do you know if she's been able to reconnect? It does not look like it, unfortunately. So, okay. Perhaps well, I will, I will continue a pace. Um, I think separately, she just sent me a note that she's restarting her computer. Okay. Um, and we will continue along. So, um, okay. So, um, I think many of you probably also are, understand this. Designations follow a newer revised NACs. Um, uh, the Clean Air Act requires that we designate all areas of the country, including Indian country, which may be of, of interest in a number of areas for the participants here today. Um, and we designate those areas as attainment, non-attainment, or unclassifiable. Section 107 governs how that works. And there's you know kind of a stepwise process where different players take the lead. Um, so uh, you can see some of the sub bullets here. And I believe we have some additional slides that go into a little more specific detail on the timing of um, which party does what during this two-year designations process. We did have um, one question in the box about what uh, NACS stands for. Um, sure, um, it stands for the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. So these are national standards set by EPA um, to, again, uh, as far as the primary standards go, protect um, public health within an adequate margin of safety. Um, I think the first standards were from 1970, right? And then as far as PM 2.5 goes, the first standard was 1997, followed by revisions for different averaging periods in 2006 and 2012. So, yeah, if there's any other acronyms or things that I'm rushing over, by all means, we'd be happy to take those questions and respond. I, do, I saw a hand flashing from Sayona. Yeah. Oh my God. It's yeah. a mistake. I'm so, so okay. sorry. I don't know what's happening on the computer to please ignore. Gremlins so in the system. And it looks like we have uh, Lindsay back. Um, okay. Computer crash, but let's see if uh, we can connect with Lindsay now to take over. Yeah, can you all hear me okay? Yes. I can. Okay. So I will go on mute and turn off my video and Lindsay, take it away. We are on this um, designations and implementation timeline. Thank you, Rory. And yeah, thank you for jumping in. Sorry, everyone. Um, te technical difficulties. Um, my computer said I lost microphone and then it froze. So um, thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> Sorry, I um, accidentally advanced one slide by clicking. Is there a way we can go back? 
Yeah. Go ahead and go back here. That's Thank you. All right, Lindsay, you should have control. Please take it away. All right. Um, so I'm sure um, Rory did a great job kind of walking through the first few slides. Um, so this is just kind of a, a more detailed timeline of the deadlines that are coming up. Um, and this is based on a two year anticipated timeline for designations. Um, so as you can see here, the most important date that I, I wanna point out here is this February 7th of 2025. Um, that is um, one year after the promulgation date um, of the new next. So that, that's kind of the next major step in the process. Um, this is when states and tribes will submit the designations recommendations to us. Um, and, the, and this due date is uh, based on the date, um, like I mentioned, um, of when we announced um, the new next. So February 7th, um, they're due one year later. Um, the next step in the process, after we review these recommendations, we're required to notify states of any modifications um, that we're considering um, making to these recommendations. So this notification is referred to as a 120 day letter. Um, you might hear that term a lot kind of thrown around in this designations process. Um, it's only called a 120 day letter because we send it out 120 days before the designations are finalized. Um, so typically we ask that states provide any additional information um, that they would like EPA to consider um, in our final designations within 60 days of that 120 day letter. Um, and you can see on the screen, that's that kind of October 9th, um, 2025 date. Um, and then we kind of have this, this comment period. Um, so typically uh, the EPA will finalize designations two years after the next um, are you know, announced. Um, so in this case, by February, 2026, You'll notice the date's a little wonky. That's just because it was a leap year um, when we announced <laughs> the, the NAC. So um, that's, that's not a mistake. That's a good old leap year um, Easter egg there. Um, yeah, so um, at this time, we're still intending to finalize designations within the two year uh, time frame. Um, and you'll have these slides. So um, you'll have this kind of um, timeline that you can look at. Um, and if you want to make it your computer background, um, you know, whatever you want to do with it, you'll, you'll have it. Okay. Um, so for my next slide, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, identifying non-attainment areas and boundaries. Um, so boundaries for each non-attainment area will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we strive for national consistency in decisions um, as the EPA. So we do work closely with headquarters and our other regional offices as needed to make sure that there is national consistency in these decisions. Um, boundaries are gonna be determined by a weight of evidence approach um, based on the consideration of five factors. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the five factors on my next slide, but I did wanna mention um, that we do start kind of this, this process by evaluating monitored data. So we identify violations using data from FRM and FEM monitors that are cited and operated in accordance with the regulations. So these are um, our regulatory monitors. That's kind of the big first step um, in this process. Um, so we also consider data from non-FRM FEM monitors, such as sensor data, air quality modeling, um, where, where available, um, that can also help us determine boundaries for this area. I'll talk about that um, a little bit more. Um, so, so boundaries um, may be for the whole country, but they don't have to be. Um, they can be larger or small, depending on where there are sources that can contribute to an area um, that is not attaining the next. Um, and I did wanna note out here the, the years of data that we're considering. Um, so for this initial designations before we respond with our 120 day letters, we're looking at um, air quality monitoring data from 2021 through 2023. Um, and then we'll likely use 2022 through 2024 for final decisions. Um, and again, that's just because we use the most three most recent years of data. And as we're moving through this process, time will also move on. So um, we just wanna use the most um, available data we have.
Um, so I did want to talk about the PM designations mapping tool, but I feel like perhaps I missed something. So one second here. Let's go back. Yeah, I did. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. So we're going to talk about the five factors analysis first. Um, so for non-attainment area, um, EPA recommends error agencies base boundary rec recommendations on the evaluation of five factors. I kind of alluded to this on my last slide. Um, and these are the same five factors that EPA will also consider in its evaluation of boundaries for that. Area. So the, um, the states will do their evaluation and then EPA will do a similar one and compare. Um, the five factors are air quality data. So that was what I was mentioning. These are the design values from regulatory monitors. That's kind of the first factor we consider. The second is emissions and emissions related data. Uh, this is looking at, you know, um, inventories, emissions inventories, um, permitting information to kind of understand the sources in the area, um, what, is, what is being put out there. Um, the third factor we consider is meteorology. Um, this is high splits. Um, it's looking at how the air travels um, throughout the region. Um, the fourth one we consider is topography. So if there's a mountain range, um, a valley, um, anything that might influence the air shed, um, and where the particle pollution might go or hang out. That's something um, we also consider. And finally, we look at jurisdictional boundaries. Um, this includes, you know, county level um, lines, uh, anything that, um, if there's been a non-attainment area before, um, any of those kind of man-made um, lines on maps that we consider. Um, this, so those are kind of the, the main five factors that we, we hope to see in your recommendations the recommendations. Um, now, these factors are included in the PM 2.5 designations mapping tool that states and tribes to help um, you all kind of make these recommendations. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on, on the next slide. Perfect, okay. Um, so this slide shows a screen capture of the PM 2.5 designations mapping tool on the right-hand side. Um, this mapping tool is a web-based tool that includes various ArcGIS data layers in an easy to use format. Um, and there's a link actually right below that picture too. So folks can go ahead and check that out um, after if they want. Um, so this tool provides air agencies access to air quality data, emissions data, um, and so on to assist in evaluating those five factors. It's all loaded into the tool. Um, it also allows users to visualize the data on a map and to overlay layers so that they can be visualized together and compared. Um, in the past, I think EPA has made this tool available a little bit later in the designations process, um, and we heard feedback that it would be more helpful to have this tool sooner. So for the purposes, um, we listened um, and we, we made it available um, now so folks can get familiar with the tool and how to use it. Um, that being said, um, we are continuing to update the tool as newer data sets are available. Keep in mind, um, we did make the tool available. Um, not all of the data sets um, are currently in place that will be needed to make these recommendations, but we're working as fast as we can to get them uploaded. So um, if you were to open the tool today, you will see that there are 2022 design values, um, which is great for learning the tool. Um, but we are actively working on getting the 2023 design values in there um, that then can be used for the designations process. So, so just be aware that it's, it's there, but it's still um, actively being updated. Um, so I, fortunately, we can't speak to the exact time frame as to when this tool is going to be complete, um, the data sets uploaded that everyone will need, um, since that's kind of being done by our headquarters office. Um, but it's our understanding that they're aiming to get as much of the data as they can over the next couple months. Um, so um, new data sets include the 2023 design values, updating modeling output and emissions data. So um, it's getting updated all the time. Uh, keep checking back and yeah, we'll, we'll keep you updated on that as well. Um, okay, so exceptional events are always um, a topic folks are interested in. So I thought I would share some resources with you all as well. 
Um, so these are the resources we have made available to support states and districts as they are considering developing exceptional event demonstrations for this process. Um, so uh, we wanted to just kind of mention them here. They've also been talked about in a lot of other forums. So um, I don't wanna go too in depth into all of this, um, but I'll, I'll briefly touch on them. So um, the first tool um, are data visualization and comparison tools. Um, an example of what these kind of look like are shown in the top right hand of this slide. The intent with these tools is to help agencies identify event influenced PM 2.5 data that are likely to have regulatory significance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the EPA does not really expect agencies to develop um, exceptional events demonstrations for events that would not affect the final designations outcome. Um, so these tools are to help agencies determine whether events would affect the designation or boundary recommendation um, and when other, um, it would make sense to pursue an exceptional events demonstration. So the first one kind of helps you decide, do I need to do an exceptional events um, for, for the designations process? Um, the second tool is a wildfire um, exceptional events tiering supplement. This document contains information on tiering wildfire PM events, similar to the approach that might've been used for some time for wildfire ozone events. Um, this is kind of to help figure out the right size of your exceptional events demonstration. Uh, so this document is intended to guide agencies in determining how much evidence is appropriate to support the clear causal relationship that exceptional events require. Um, for example, um, for some events where it's more clear cut that the wildfire um, had a huge impact on PM, the weight of evidence required for that exceptional event demonstration is lower um, as compared to an event where the air quality impact might be less obvious. Um, so this, this document has some information on how to assess that level of information needed to support a particular uh, exceptional events demonstration. Um, it also applies to wildland fire events affecting PM 2.5 concentrations, um, both for the annual or the 24 hour standard. Um, but of course, we're only talking about the annual today. Um, and finally, um, number three on this list, um, EPA worked with collaborators um, at the U.S. Forest Service, the state of California, Placer County Air Pollution Control District, and the Northern Sierra Air Quality Management District um, to develop an exceptional events demonstration for a prescribed fire. Um, and that has been made available as an example for air agencies to look at, um, along with several additional resources, such as a ah, prescribed fire frequently asked questions document and a um, kind of a template or what one of those demonstrations would look like. Um, so this is, you know, that was a lot of information. Um, these are here, um, you know, there's a lot of best practice materials that EPA has made available recently as well. Um, and I wanted to note um, on the EPA side um, that we are committed to ensuring a timely and efficient process um, for evaluating and um, making exceptional event determinations. Um, I know Region 9, we usually have quite a bit. It's it's quite a bit of our workload. So um, we are really considering that as we move forward and, and prioritizing these. Um, I also wanted to put in a quick plug that we encourage early communication between air agencies um, and EPA. So if you think that you are going to submit exceptional events um, for your designations recommendations, um, please let us know um, so we can kind of plan for that in our workload. Um, you can reach out to me or um, my PM designations team, um, I can I can help uh, lead you to them. Let's see. Oh. All right. Um, so this next slide, um, I wanted to just kind of give an overview of what air quality um, looks like in the United States. Um, I know not everybody is in Region Nine here, so. Um, I did want to note that this map shows 2022 design values. It does not show 2023. Um, that's just because we're still finalizing the 2023 values. So I didn't want to show you anything that's, you know, not permanent or could change. Um, so you can see here, this is a map of the whole United States. Um, the light green is areas that um, in 2022, their design values were meeting the new NACs of nine micrograms per meter squared. Um, the dark green areas um, are for areas that were not, um, their 2022 design value were not meeting the nine micrograms per meter squared. 
Um, now note that, of course, this was 2022. We're basing our initial designations off of 2023 and then finalizing those based off of a 2024 design value. So um, just because something's green, uh, dark green in this map doesn't mean that it's it's going to stay that way, nor does it you know, intend um, to say this is what the, the boundaries will look like. This is just um, regulatory monitor data. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a snapshot um, of, of where some of these areas might be. But again, um, this is all subject to change. All right, and now we're zooming way far ahead into the future. So if an area is classified as non-attainment, um, I did want to remind folks that um, PM non-attainment areas are all classified as moderate. Um, it's a little different from ozone where you know there might be marginal or serious um, based on how far from the standard you were. For PM, everyone starts on the same footing, everyone's moderate. Um, so if, if you are um, classified as a non-attainment area or the area you work is, um, Attainment plans will be due 18 months from the effective date of designations, and the attainment date is going to be no later than the end of the sixth calendar. Um, so I put an example here. Um, if final designations have an effective date of spring 2026, which is kind of what we're aiming for, um, that means that attainment plans will be due in fall of 2027, um, and the attainment date would be December 31st, 2032. Um, so just kind of keep those dates in mind as you think ahead and kind of workload planning. Um, yes. Next slide. Um, okay, I did want to also um, share a number of resources so folks have them. If you want to click through these, um, you'll see the PM designations memo, which goes into more detail about how to um, write these recommendations for designations. Um, and the mapping tool, along with a few other um, links for you. Um, and finally, um, here's my contact information. Um, I'm sorry I had computer issues and um, couldn't present the whole time, but I really appreciate uh, Rory Mays for stepping in um, while my computer was restarting. Um, so it was great to meet you all. Um, I'm available by um, phone or email if you have any questions about the PM designations process. Um, we're, we're happy to work with you. So just, just give us a call. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Rory, for, for filling in during that time. Um, just a reminder, everybody, if you uh, showed up late, um, please feel free to um, ask questions as they come up um, in the Q&A chat box at the bottom. However, we won't be addressing any questions until all of the presenters have spoken. Um, and also a reminder, we'll be sharing this presentation. So any of the links to resources, um, you'll be able to access those um, after the webinar. So with that, I'm going to hand off control to Hillary, our COO, to discuss the, um, the history of the standard and a little bit more background. So please feel free to take it away. Thank you. And I'm trying to figure out how to advance this. There we go. <laughs> It's always it takes it takes a, a little bit here. Um, so I wanted to um, first of all thank you, Lindsay. That was great, and I'm going to have some some overlap with you, with yours from a different perspective. I think um, you know, or or my perspective of having been around forever. Um, <laughs> so you know, uh, Rory mentioned this that in 1997 the the PM 2.5 um, standards were set, and um, it just it thought it was really interesting. You know, it started out at 65 micrograms per meter cubed for the 24 hour average. Um, now we're at 35. Um, the annual average started at 15 micrograms per meter cubed and we're, you know, now we're going down to nine. So things have been strengthened over time. The form of the standard, meaning how you calculate whether or not you've met the standard, what the standard is, you know, the averaging times, et cetera, that's um, changed over time as well. Sorry, having trouble with my controls. There we go. Um, I, I wanted to also just remind us of what kind of sources uh, are out there uh, for PM 2.5. And so the, again, these are particles less than uh, two and a half microns in size. And um, you know, we've talked, there's combustion sources like you know, burning coal or gasoline or diesel, fuel, um, wood, and then um, the kind of 
um, you know, source types, so industry, wildfires as we're hearing, or fires. Uh, there's also uh, chemistry that occurs that can take gases and turn, you know, essentially they can be converted into particles. And motor vehicles, as we know, are a big source of emissions as well. Sorry, um, having trouble driving here. <laughs> um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was that the um, the gold standard at the time in 1997, or a federal reference method FRM, was filter collection, essentially drawing air through a filter and then um, very uh, doing mass measurements and and looking at um, uh, those filters. They were collected usually every three to six days. So it wasn't continuous um, information that began to improve in 2008 when um, federal equivalent methods, FBM, began to be approved. And these were automated, continuous, non-filter based measurements. And that um, was a, a, a really big change at the time. Um, and the um, in this most recent um, um, designation, sorry, not designation, this most recent change the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, or CASAC, advised EPA to address um, the bias between the FEMs and FRMs to make them more comparable. And um, actually, Crystal's going to talk about that a little bit, but I just kind of want to point that out. Um, and one thing about the filter measurements, which are still being collected uh, across the United States, is that um, with certain kinds of filters, you can um, look at the composition or understand the composition of the particles that you've collected. And that's gonna become important as I move ahead here. So I just wanted to point out the PM 2.5 mass um, measurement sites, mostly F, you know, FEMs are um, pretty broadly, uh, there's a lot of sites in the United States. Um, and um, this is just a snapshot from Air Now uh, showing where uh, the uh, measurements are being taken. Um, but then also the filter based measurements that are part of uh, also across the United States, not nearly as many of them as you can see on this map here. So we're talking about speciated PM 2.5. What that means is that we're looking at the composition of the, um, of the collected mass on the filters and trying to understand um, the components, you know, what kind of metals are there in there? Is there organic carbon, elemental carbon? And I, I'll show you sort of how we look at that. And then also this is more based on um, urban, more urban based sites for the most part. And then there's a um, the IMPROVE network, which is um, the uh, a very important one, um, which is more based on the rural and protected visibility areas like national parks, et cetera, a pretty extensive network of um, speciated uh, particulate matter data as well. So one of the things about the um, these, these sites are the speciation network, um, the chemical speciation network, um, which started in the late 90s. Um, they're Basically, they're not used for attainment or non-attainment of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards um, decisions, but they are intended to complement the activities of the, you know, PM 2.5 mass measurements. And um, they're used for multiple things, th these data. You can look at trends over time, and I'm going to show you an example of that. They help in the development of um, state Im implementation plans um, and, you know, determining whether or not you're meeting, you're complying with regula regulations. The, um, they also can be helpful in developing emission control strategies. They help you track progress of your control programs that you've put in to reduce PM. And you know they can aid um, health researchers in looking at interpreting um, the health studies that are linking different effects, uh, health effects to PM 2.5 components, not just mass. And um, you know you also can start understanding the annual and seasonal spatial variation across different um, different components. So there's a lot of information that can be um, gained from the speciated data in addition to the mass data. 
So this is just a quick look at the um, a couple of different sites in the country. I just picked them randomly from the um, EPA's trend um, uh, trends report that's um, online interactive and it's pretty cool. And essentially you can take the speciation data, composition data, and um, break it into um, sea salt, um, uh, elemental carbon, crustal or basically dust, um, nitrates, sulfates, and organic carbon. And one of the things I want to point out is the San Joaquin Valley on the West Coast versus a site in Virginia on the East Coast look very different. Concentrations are different. Um, there's a lot more sulfate um, in the Virginia site and very little sulfate in the San Joaquin Valley site. Instead, there's a lot more nitrate in the in this uh, on in the in the West versus um, the Eastern sites. Um, and then, but the other thing is that there is a uh, pretty constant amount of organic carbon that's showing up um, in the San Joaquin Valley, in the site in Virginia, and it really hasn't changed over time. And that's gonna, that means that if we look at these la latter years, instead of sulfate being one of the most important components, now carbon is. And so that's a, um, a you know, same thing. It's become much more important to us as we look at the, um, at the data and think about how we're gonna do um, controls. I wanted to dive in a little bit into another, another location. Um, and if you basically separate out the data the way you saw in the previous graphic um, and look at the composition you know, in each sample, let's say over some time period, this was a case of looking at a couple of years of data in um, at, at an improved site in, um, Martha's Vineyard, way way out um out, out um offshore of Massachusetts, uh, state of Massachusetts, and you could see two site uh, two samples that really stood out at, if we're looking at all these all the data, and if you dive into it a little bit more, you can see that for those two sites, um, the carbon component was was dominant, and in doing some investigation of using. Um, you know, the high split modeling, so looking at trajectories, smoke maps, et cetera, those two days were actually impacted by Canadian wildfires. And this was, um, this is 19, uh, sorry, 2021. So the data allowed us to not just see that we had high concentrations, but gave us a really good idea of probably what impacts, you know, the impacts were from, and then we dove in a little deeper and we could confirm that. Um, you've probably seen pie charts, and I, again, from the same location, I wanted to talk about um, some of the ways to look at data. And um, one, of, one of the things you can do in addition to just taking the chemical components is you can also take this data and put it into a source apportionment tool like positive matrix factorization. And EPA uh, developed the, um, a, a use, use very nice tool called EPA PMF. It was developed in the early 2000s, but it's still in widespread use. And essentially, it mathematically teases out the components that are emitted together. And then, you know, based on those components, you can attribute them to different source types. Um, and so in this case, this is for that same location that I just showed. Um, essentially, we were able to look at essentially an anthropogenic, um, you know, factor or, or source type. That was about almost 30%, and that's in the blue here. And it was essentially a lot of a lot of carbon and then some um some metals that essentially show us that that um and it has a certain diurnal and, and um se sorry, excuse me, seasonal profile that really pointed towards you know um essentially urban type emissions, man-made emissions. Ammonium sulfate again at that site was very high, um, and that's mainly from coal combustion, as you know, sulfur dioxide emissions, and that's been coming down over time. Um, and then you know another important one was sea salt at this site because it's right next to the Atlantic, it's right in the Atlantic Ocean essentially. So this this is a um, obviously a piece of the PM two point five that we don't have control over. <laughs> um, and then uh, there was another carbon-based um, factor or source type that looked to have both natural, so biogenic, you know, tree emissions uh, and, and man-made emissions. And then there's ammonium nitrate and dust are the smaller ones. 
the reason I wanted to show this kind of analysis is that this is important um, for the um, agencies to be able to dive in and understand what, what their source types might be, um, and then to think about how they're going to, um, <laughs> I see a question, we'll, we'll get to the questions later. Um, and I, the, um, what they want to be able to, what we want to be able to do is help direct how, what we're going to uh, reduce in, emissions wise in order to improve our PM 2.5 concentration. And then I'm just going to show a couple of things. I talked about how important particulate carbon is, and it's increasingly um, still important because we're going to, um, we're, we're reducing sulfate um, um, directly, and we are seeing a higher frequency of wildfires. So it becomes very important, um, continually to be more important. So elemental carbon, it's also known as black carbon, is formed by incomplete combustion. Uh, you know, major sources are going to be, you know, diesel engines, for example. And then organic carbon is also from incomplete, incomplete combustion, but it can also have biogenic and um, anthropogenic sources as well. I wanted to point out that the colors, this, this, this filter on the left, um, was collected during a wildfire. So this was more smoke oriented. And in fact, I had these, these you could actually smell smoke um, on this filter. This this was collected um, in it uh, near a, a heavily um, a diesel engine emissions, and it smelled like it smelled like diesel. It's very interesting, but you can see the difference in color. So the super black versus more of a brownish color. And the thing that's interesting is that you can um, why that di visual difference also translates into that you can. Um, in an ethylometer, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, you which is a way to measure black carbon, um, you can you can basically differentiate between the the black carbon from diesel and the browner carbon from um, wood, uh, wood wood combustion. So the ethylometer is the instrument that's most used in the world for real time monitoring and speciation of the black carbon, and you know more than forty years, it's amazing. And basically particles are collected continuously by drawing this particle laden air through spots on a filter tape. And then the detectors look at the transmission of light through the particle laden tape and unloaded tape. And the difference can be, can be basically um, uh, goes towards how much black carbon is in, in the air over the time period that was sampled. And that, as I mentioned, you can differentiate between black carbon from diesel exhaust and biomass burning, and that's by using multiple wavelengths of light and uh, some pretty slick computation. And then organic carbon measurements, again, focusing on the, the a very key part of our particle um, composition. The OC measurements, um, including the speciation, have traditionally been made with filters, but there are now continuous organic carbon measurements. Um, and this will greatly understand our data analysis in support of, of um, you know, focusing in on our sources of organic carbon. So uh, Lindsay has a, had a great slide on, on resources. And I want to kind of, again, going back in history here, in 1997, we had all, the, you know, these new regulations. And we there was a tremendous effort from EPA to create training on PM 2.5 and how to look at the data. Same, and then there was um, source apportionment development of you know, EPA PMF um, and this multivariate receptor modeling workbook and, and training. And um, there's also more recent training on the chemical speciation network. You saw that there was exceptional events guidance and tools visualization tools, et cetera. And so a lot of these are available through the Ambient Monitoring Technology Information Center, AMTIC, um, through EPA. And it really has a lot of great information there um, for you. But, oh, you know, essentially a lot of these um, tools and training material were developed, uh, initially developed way back, uh, you know, 24 years ago. So pretty, pretty, pretty uh, robust length of time that we've been looking at these data. With that, I'm going to do one more slide. Um, essentially, you know, three takeaway points. Tightening the standard brings more areas into non-attainment potentially. Um, particulate carbon is increasingly important given that we've reduced sulfate and there are higher frequency of wildfires. 
And compared to 1997, we have much, much better measurements. For example, the continuous data and some continuous speciation data and tools to understand the collected data and help inform mitigation strategy, strategies. Thank you very much. Great, all right, thank you, Hillary. Uh, I think due to our technical issues, we're running a little bit behind schedule here. So hopefully our last couple of presentations uh, we can get through to leave enough time for Q&A. So with that, I will hand it off to uh, Crystal. Crystal, please take it away. Sounds good. I will do my best. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Crystal. I'm an atmospheric scientist here at Sonoma Technology. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of our work um, where we've been assessing the impact of wildfire smoke on exceptional events across the U.S. Um, and there is a good amount of motivation that goes along with this. Uh, I know that we're all being affected by wildfires. It's driving a decline in air quality, and I think we've all felt that, um, especially here in the western U.S., but I think the entire country felt that in 2023 with the Canadian wildfires. Um, and under the current regulations, these enhanced air pollution concentrations caused by exceptional events or EEs, including wildfire smoke events, can be removed from attainment calculations if there's certain criteria are met. And I do want to be very clear with this. Um, the exceptional events are really to remove processes that an area cannot control. So an area, the attainment designations are really, um, they're supposed to focus on what you can control in your area. Um, for example, an area in Nevada can't control that there's a wildfire in California. Um, and doing these exceptional events um, help remove that from the attainment calculations. But exceptional events don't remove that data from the record. It's still there, um, still available. So, um, as we've all been talking about, the regulatory significance here is that that primary PM 2.5 annual standard has been reduced to 9.0, which will really alter the frequency that regions are impacted um, the, by wildfire smoke. And then also KSAC is recommending changes for the ozone standard, and EPA said they're going to start that review process. So I think it's really important to understand the extent that smoke air smoke impacts air quality in the US um, and how the treatment of these events could really impact attainment determinations. Um, so investigating these events is pretty key. I do wanna take um, kind of a sidestep here and talk about some recent updates to the PM 2.5 measurements. So one thing that's happened very recently that state locals and tribals here are gonna be very familiar with um, is this retroactively applied network data alignment um, on the Teledyne T640 and T640X um, PM, hourly PM 2.5 measurements. Uh, but if you're not familiar, basically that application was done to PM 2.5 data in AQS under the 600 level um, method code for active um, uh, for active measurements, and then the 700 level method code um, that was applied retroactively to that PM 2.5 data. Um, that correction actually, um, almost across the board, reduced PM 2.5 concentrations because there was a high bias um, on the Teledyne instruments. And this actually affects, this correction affects design values and attainment. This is kind of all hot off the presses, so, um, this is pretty preliminary. Um, I know that Lindsay was saying they don't have the design values done for 2021 to 2023, but I went ahead and calculated them on my own you know, using the, the equations in the Federal Register. And using those updated Teledyne T640 and T640X concentrations, um, I went ahead and calculated uh, the PM 2.5 design values. Um, and this is really important, as Lindsay was talking about, um, that 2021 to 2023, um, that's the attainment assessment period, and then 2022 to 2024 is probably when determinations will be made. So all of this together, um, the PM 2.5 annual standard update and this Teledyne correction um, are really important. It's really, with both of these things, it's really important to understand the possibility 
of attainment for each area and then the impacts from wildfire smoke. So why are we getting into all of this? Well, we wanted to build a tool that would help folks figure out when they were being affected by wildfires and how that um, played into exceptional events. So what we did is we developed a nationwide ozone and PM2.5 screening methodology um, that uses lots of different things here, like the NOAA Hazard Mapping System, or HMS. We also use modeled smoke PM2.5. Um, we use all monitor observations um, for all PM2.5 sites and ozone sites throughout the US. And then we also created a generalized additive model called a GAM. Once we did that, we created a screening methodology. Um, we compared this to a bunch of different case studies as well as submitted and concurred exceptional events. Um, and then we evaluated um, our results uh, in areas that we thought were likely or not likely um, to be affected by wildfire smoke. And then finally, um, we took these screened values and we looked to see how um, how those played in as exceptional events and how the design values changed. So the goal of this was really to create an automated solution for the laborious task of screening exceptional events, which is usually undertaken by air agencies. So I'm gonna go into methods. I know my, my particular um, presentation here is a lot more um, researchy than the others. I hope that's okay. Um, but we were we performed the screening for the 2020 to 2022 and 2021 to 2023 design value periods. Um, like I said, we used a lot of these data sets that are listed over here on the left. We also included meteorological data for the GAM. Um, what you really need to understand about the GAM is it's a model to predict pollutant concentrations. And the difference between what the GAM predicts and what the actual concentration was on that given day is called the residual. And this can be an estimate of wildfire impact on those pollutant concentrations. Um, and with all of that input data, we created the screening methodology. And it's really complicated <laughs> over there on the left, but here's the highlights. So. We start out with a smoke screening. Um, we just want to see, was there smoke in the area? And then there's two different pathways there. Um, there was smoke, yes, in the area, or maybe there wasn't smoke, but PM 2.5 was really high. So we're able to catch both the true positive and false negative here. Um, and then things kind of split. They go two different directions, one for ozone and one for PM 2.5, but um, in both cases, they have to pass a really high GAM residual and show smoke influence, or it has to be a very, very high um, GAM residual to get to the end point, which is we think the dates that come out of the screening method are probable exceptional events, but we still have to, you know, look through the data and make sure that that's correct. When we were actually evaluating this method, um, we found that only the most significantly impacted smoke days actually were able to pass the screening. Um, so we were missing some of the edge cases where maybe smoke was a little bit lighter, um, or maybe the HMS smoke didn't quite make it to that area. So uh, we loosened some of the screening pieces just to make sure we were catching more of the moderately smoke impacted days, and we have different classes for those. Okay. Just a really quick um, illustration on what those GAM results look like. So um, I'm, I'm gonna focus on the right over here. So the circles are the GAM residuals in of PM2.5. So higher um, values mean that um, we suspect that there is a large deviation um, from what the, the concentration should have been due to wildfire smoke. Um, and you can see that those large and um, more red colored circles are uh, correlated with um, the HMS smoke. So the gray uh, polygons are where smoke was seen in Southern California. So we find good agreement overall between um, what was observed and what our, our GAM uh, predicted, except for in those exceptional event cases like you would expect. Okay, let's move on to some results. I know I said that um, we did this for ozone and PM2.5, but I'm going to focus on PM2.5 because that's the webinar that we're, we're on right now. So our results um, are shown 
these are the days that came through the screening. So they're not necessarily exceptional events. They're just dates that were smoke impacted. So we have to make it a little bit further down the line before we can say they're exceptional events. So the top is for the design value period between 2020 to 2022, and the bottom is 2021 to 2023. You can see that the Western sites are, are most impacted um, by, are most impacted by smoke days. There's some sites in Utah and Montana that show um, kind of a large, a, a large number of days. Those are likely sites that are infected affected by both California and Canadian fires and Pacific Northwest fires. East shows, uh, East US shows fewer screen dates um, being further downwind from those fires in the West, but you can tell the difference between the 2020 to 2022, and then the bottom panel, including 2023, we see a lot more dates in the Eastern US um, that are impacted by smoke. And then just kind of splitting the US into these different regions that are shown down here on the left. Um, we can kind of see what's happening um, on the right for, we split it up by region, um, top to bottom, and then years left to right. Um, and PM2.5 in the central, southwest, and western US um, were definitely significantly affected by the 2020 fires. Um, in the southeast, that blue line, dark blue, um, you can see more year-round burning uh, due to prescribed fires, and then the Great Lakes and Northeast region, uh, that teal and purple color, uh, were affected more by the 2021 and 2023 Canadian fires. So what does this actually mean in terms of PM2.5 concentration? So what we did is we compared the residual of the GAN output um, on smoke days versus not smoke days. So this is the difference between smoke and non-smoke. And I want to say that for the non-smoke days, the average residual was around zero, meaning that our, uh, our model was able to predict well what was happening on days that we didn't classify as smoke. For smoke days, we saw a much higher residual, meaning there was an impact from smoke um, for both the class A and B. Um, but there's a large spread, so that shows there's variability in the impacts on PM2.5 from wildfires. But over here on the right, we can see the difference between those two design value periods. Obviously, the Western US was really affected by those 2020 fires, um, and then the Northeast and Great Lakes were um, much more affected by the 2023 fires compared to the previous design value year. Um, just quickly about our screening evaluation, kind of the results from this um, were the fact that some of the modeled smoke PM2.5 seemed to under predict PM2.5 concentrations from wildfires. And um, this is the reason why we created the classes. Um, so this particular day in Eugene, Oregon, um, the day on the right modeled smoke was zero, which I mean, that seems silly. There's a wildfire right there, um, but with the new classes, we were able to correctly capture this particular date. And then an ozone date in Las Vegas, we were able to capture because this date said that there was no smoke, but there, there definitely was. So I know that was really quick. I'm sure there will be questions, but um, overall, we developed a nationwide screening methodology for PM2.5 and ozone um, impacts from wildfires. We definitely saw um, the Western US and Southwestern US affected by those California fires in 2020 and 2021. And then the Canadian fires were affecting uh, more of the Eastern US in 2021 and 2023. So our final task here is really to assess the impact of inclusion or exclusion of those classified screened dates um, on attainment given the new NACs. So that'll be our last step. And we're hoping to put this data out for free on a let me click something okay <laughs> on a dashboard for people to use i want to say thank you to epri for funding this work and i will hand it back off to dan great thank you so much crystal um we'll move on to our last speaker uh ryan moffett the department manager for advanced air measurements here at sonoma tech all right, Ryan, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, okay, so 
to advance slide into my presentation. So yeah, um, my name is Ryan Moffitt, uh, and I am here to present some uh, some work that we've done over the years to characterize particles. Um, and so, you know, taking a, a big step uh, away from more regulatory measurements, um, I'm going to get into some very, very um, detailed measurements of particle aerosol chemical and physical properties. And so most of this work has been done in close collaboration with Purdue University, my colleague Alex Laskin and his team, um, and then also Matthew Frown, who you see on here as well. Um, so, you know, just to kind of, you know, state why, why we stutter, uh, study atmospheric particulate matter. Um, so A is the negative health effects. And, you know, I think that's probably one of the main reasons why it's even regulated in the first place. And, I, you know, I show an example of some particles that contain lead and chloride that we sampled way back in 2008. Um, and, you know, our specialty is micro, uh, microscopy measurements. So if, if we ever want to know like detailed, detailed information on um, particle sources, um, this is the type of measurement that you would use. Um, and so another reason why we study um, atmospheric aerosol is visibility de degradation. In fact, the IMPROVE network that Hillary mentioned was, was set up you know, primarily to address the visibility de degradation in um, national parks. And then lastly, uh, most of this work is actually um, uh, is motivated by uh, understanding, you know, aerosols role in climate effects. Um, so it's probably one of the most uncertain uh, climate forcers out there. And so the Department of Energy has funded us to go through and um, find out as much as we can about the detailed chemical and physical properties. Um, and, you know, I think when, whenever we talk about particles and composition, um, I think, you know, it's always good to think about the size distribution, because the size distribution tells you a lot about, you know, what the particles might be composed of and where they come from. Um, and so this is a this is a kind of a figure that you'll see in, in many textbooks. Um, and I usually like to start at the bottom and work up. And so, you know, the first two modes that we have are what we term fine particles. So these are everything below 2.5 microns. Um, and then above 2.5 microns, we have coarse particles. And so the coarse particles are going to be formed by mechanical agitation. Um, so like wave breaking for sea spray, you know, volcanic eruption, direct injection of dust into the atmosphere. Um, plants will even directly emit particles into the atmosphere. Um, and also windblown dust is important for desert regions as well. And then if you go back down into the fine particles, um, we can talk about like, you know, the very, very smallest particles from 10 nanometers up to 100 nanometers. Those are going to be your nucleation mode particles. Those are where the gas molecules physically come and stick together to make um, what we would term a particle. You know, they're collections of molecules at some point. But then once you get above 100 nanometers, that's where uh, condensation and coagulation um, primarily drives the, the particle um, you know, characteristics there. And so, you know, you'll always have the gas to particle conversion, which I'll touch on towards the end. Um, so I think the main point is that, um, you know, the air, always go back to aerosol size as your zero order, um, uh, you know, kind of indicator of what the characteristics of, of the, the particulate matter is. So how do we get even more detailed information than that? Well, uh, for the past 10, 15 years, we've been focusing on microscopy ap ap applications. So I'm going to show a lot of images in this presentation. Um, a lot of the microscopes operate in much the same general way. You take an image and associated with that image, there can be some composition information. So I'll you know, show you an example of one type of instrument that we use to get you know, that, that what we call chemical imaging of particles. And so the instrument that, that we typically use is located at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, this is actually Ernest Orlando Lawrence's, one of his original buildings where he had accelerators. And in there, there's an electronic accelerator, 
um, where the electrons are wiggled, they transmit X-rays. Those X-rays are focused by this thing called a zone plate. And then at the focal point of the X-ray beam, we have our sample containing particles. And the X-rays then are transmitted to that sample as it's translated to get an image. And the X-rays, the transmitted X-rays are detected by an X-ray detector. And so we can get an image at a single energy, or we can step the energy and collect a number of images. So that's what we would call, quote unquote, a stack. And then you can drill down into a pixel of that stack and get um, some spectral information, um, mainly on carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So these are your light elements, which are very, very important for the accumulation mode particles. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the spectrum that you get out is, is quantitative, uh, as is beer as it is governed by Beer's law. So that's where your optical density, that's the intensity of a pixel in the image is proportional to the mass absorption coefficient, the density and the thickness of that particle. Um, so like I mentioned, we can do light elements very well. So uh, here is an example of how quantitative we can be for carbon. So what we've done is we've done a lab study where we have ratios, different ratios of ammonium sulfate to sucrose, 10 to 1, 1 to 1, 10, uh, 1 to 10. On the top uh, set of images are the organic volume fractions ranging from 0 to 1, 1 being organic volume fraction of, uh, of you know, of, of one and zero be, mean zero organic volume fractions with no organics. And we also do these false color images and you'll see a lot of these in the next few slides where blue is the inorganic non-carbonaceous regions and green is the organic dominant regions. And so you can see as the, the organic volume fraction increases, you know, you start losing those, those blue regions and your particles end up being about 90% organic. And we show the linearity of the technique on the right, um, just to as a proof of concept. And so the point is, is that we can be very uh, quantitative on a laboratory basis, um, and we can use some of these same methods to uh, image atmospheric aerosol as well. And so the first example I'll show you is a set of of particle of samples that we collected in Sacramento, California. We had both um, the columns indicate, you know, fine mode below a micron um, and above a micron for coarse particles. You can see that there's maybe a little bit more blue for the coarse particles. We had two sampling sites in this case, T0 and T1. T0 was located very close to the Sacramento City Center, and T1 was up in the Sierra Nevada foothills. So we actually, you would actually get transport up into the foothills on a daily basis as the boundary layer grew. And the whole purpose of this particular um, paper that we did was to quantify the morphology and characteristics of uh, black carbon in particles. And so we use that synchrotron-based um, imaging to, to actually map out where the soot was in the particles. And so the little red bits that you see are where exactly the soot is. And the green is where we have organic dominant material. And the blue, again, is inorganic dominant. And so it turns out that the morphology and mixing of black carbon within particles can strongly affect their optical properties. And it also helps you kind of see what the differences are in those different receptor regions. Um, so kind of moving from there, um, you know, what about other elements? So, so far I've focused mainly on carbon because that's probably one of the most important ones for accumulation mode. But we are able to com combine this um, kind of high level synchrotron uh, spectrum microscopy with your more standard scanning electron microscopy with metals analysis or you know analysis of heavy elements. And so what I'm showing here is a set of data from Manaus, Brazil. This is all the same particles on every single image that you see. Um, and we have the, the synchrotron-based uh, image, and then we have a scanning electron microscopy image. So the synchrotron-based gets you carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and the electron microscope gets you other things like sodium, magnesium, sulfur, chlorine, potassium. And fine mode potassium is another good um, marker for biomass burning. 
Um, and so what we've done is we've combined all of these and calculated uh, what's known as a particle diversity. And this was this uh, metric was developed by Nicole Reamer at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And she uses it to um, describe the aging process of particles in her models. And so we've been working closely with Nicole to generate some of those metrics. Um, so, you know, so far I've shown a lot of sites that have been dominated by carbonaceous aerosols, but what about something like a coastal site? So here's a, a set of data from the Azores Islands out in the middle of the Eastern and North Atlantic. And this is a paper that we're currently working on finishing up. Mostly a lot of blue, which is inorganic dominant um, particles, it's mainly sea spray aerosol. Um, and we do have a little bit of soot kind of mixed in there. And, you know, even some of the the carbon-carbon double bonds, which we call soot, can be, um, you know, associated with some biological particles. So I have kind of a zoom in there that, that kind of demonstrate that. And so, you know, this has all been, you know, very nice to have these pictures and to relate the morphology back to the optical properties. But what about some real-time measurements and direct measurement of optical properties um, that can also be linked back to sources? And so for that example, I'll talk about this other field study that was the most recent one that we've, we've done. We just wrapped up measurement on this one. It was in Crested Butte, Colorado. And it's where we were doing some online sampling of light absorbing particles with an uh, ethylometer. Hillary mentioned the ethylometer before. Um, but what we're doing is um, we're using this wavelength dependence of absorption from the ethylometer to quantify black and brown carbon. And so the ethylometer um, has a bunch of different LED lights, lights in it, and you basically shine it through a filter and you get the amount of absorption coming through on that filter. And you relate, if you have a strong uh, wavelength dependence of absorption, you can relate that back to the prevalence of brown carbon or black carbon will be fl relatively flat with respect to wavelength uh, of its absorption properties with wavelength. So what we did, so we did about a year's worth of sampling on this, and we did also microscopy collections as well. And, you know, this is a snippet of data that you see all of the different wavelengths that were collected from the ethylometer. And what we used is we used some clustering algorithms to classify the different um, uh, absorption spectra that were ga um, gathered from um, campfire events, which is where these, these little peaks of, of uh, smoke are, black carbon absorption is, and other um, aged aerosol regions and also background aerosol, which was primarily um, black carbon containing. And I'll just note that the axis on the um, time series here is inverse megameters. So if you wanted to convert that to a mass, you would divide by approximately seven, and that would get you a micrograms per meter cubed, which is maybe a little bit more relatable. And the other thing that we calculate is this thing called aeros uh, absorption angstrom exponent. Um, when that's high, it's more the the black the absorbing light absorbing carbon is more brown and so you can see like during these campfire episodes you get more of this brown carbon associated with it and what is the difference between brown and black carbon well it's operationally defined you know according to the way it absorbs light but it's also you know what we found and what alex has found a lot in his lab is that a lot of the brown carbon is associated with is actually organic carbon and so how do we get to know a little bit more about what the characteristics of that are and what's the physical properties of that um, so what Alex has done is he's taken those ethylometer tapes for those different episodes he's snipped them off and we're, what we plan on doing is um, applying this new type of analysis to get at the composition and the, the volatility of the organic component. And so what we'll do is basically take the filter sample, put it in a heater, we'll ramp up the temperature, we'll ionize it with a very soft ionization, 
And then we analyze it with a mass spec. That's a very high resolution. It gets you molecular formulas. And for each of those molecules, you can calculate what the vapor pressure might be expected to be. And so what, what Alex has done is he's plotted these, what we call volatility basis sets. Um, and so any, the dark bars are the particulate phase, the light bars are the gas phase. The horizontal axis is the saturation vapor pressure, and the vertical axis is the organic mass. And so you can see that you always have a partitioning between the gas and the particle phase. As you go up in temperature, your, uh, your particle phase organic molecules are pushed out into the gas phase. And as you go up in concentration, your um, gas phase molecules are pushed down into the particle phase. And so this is the kind of data that you can actually get with some of these, um, with this, this mass spectral analysis that they're able to do at Purdue University. And so with that, I hope I've um, just kind of given you a, a good picture of, of what particles actually look like, um, how their chemical composition might be tied to their sources, and the importance of, of, of knowing the chemical composition for, you know, assisting with the mitigation of emissions, um, and use, you know, how we use detailed um, chemical measurements to, to link it back into things like volatility, which can actually drive a lot of your, your atmospheric mass concentrations in the accumulation mode for fine particles. Um, so I think that's, it's, that's the work that we're passionate about. And um, thank you for letting me share it with you today. Oh, and I would like to also acknowledge um, the Department of Energy Atmospheric Systems Research Program um, that's funded this, this, this work for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and we are continuing to energetically move forward with this. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer anything, uh, any, any questions you guys might have. Um, and yeah, thanks again for, for the opportunity to speak. Great, thank you so much, Ryan, and to um, all of our presenters here today. Um, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule here. Um, we can extend this webinar uh, a little bit longer for folks um, to answer any questions you might have. Uh, if our panelists could turn on their cameras, um, we can start asking any questions or answering any questions. So feel free to raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, we can look at some of the questions in the chat box. So it looks like we had uh, one question, how significant are restaurant smoke and charbroiling emissions to overall PM 2.5 st status as an area source? Looks like Rory may have addressed this question, but I was wondering if any of our speakers wanted to, uh, to add on to that. I'm not sure if I answered, but... Uh... I'd be happy to, to say a quick word or two. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, cooking emissions can be important for ambient PM 2.5. It really depends on, on the area. Um, and I can't speak for the whole country, like how, how big or small it is. Um, in California, um, some of the local air districts, including San Joaquin Valley and South Coast, have been examining this source. There's some um, companies developing technology to address emissions from commercial tri runs specifically. And um, among other things, I think CARB is now has a web page that describes some of the um, information that's known about um, commercial char broiling. So I can post a link to that web page. Um, I'd be curious what other analysts might say to that. But yeah, you know, direct PM 2.5 combustion sources, including um, sometimes area sources, are certainly important. Um, they, I think, if anything, they might feature more in the plans that states develop once areas are designated on attainment. But there's clearly, like you know, a lot of lead work that goes on now over the coming years. So, great. All right, thank you, Rory. Um, looks like we have a question from uh, Doug as well. Um, this might be directed towards Crystal. Did uh, screening include Saharan dust contribution events with the GAM? or was only smoke reviewed? Um, it was only smoke 
that was reviewed. We did not um, focus on Saharan dust because this was specifically for uh, the, the study was specifically for wildfires um, and the exceptional events that are due to wildfires. Great, thank you. Um, and actually, it looks like I missed the first question from John Blair. Um, most state agencies want to classify wildfire or firework smoke as unusual events. Uh, when it comes time to declare attainment, non-attainment status, um, since wildfires are becoming regular occurrences and since fireworks are a yearly assault on our health, uh, why should those uh, uh, exceedances not be included? I open that to the floor. Um, I can go ahead and um, jump in here. Um, we definitely hear the concerns and know that wildfires are becoming um, more and more frequent. Um, so we definitely hear that concern. Um, we've, we've raised that with our headquarters office as well. Um, but right now, you know, um, we have the exceptional events rule um, as a way to kind of um, help areas um, focus on things they can control. Um, and come up with with strategies to um, lower emissions from you know maybe um, more anthropogenic sources, um, but we we definitely hear your concern and it is something we've talked to our our headquarters um, office about. But um, that's not the most satisfying answer. But for the time being, we we got to stick with the the regulations and, and rules that we have. Um, Rory, do you want to add anything? Sure. I mean, th these are like really important questions um, which have. Um, you know, merits some real, real discussion, right? So um, I guess, you know, aside from the particular regulate court, regulatory construct of things like designations and the kind of mechanisms that the exceptional events rule provides for things like wildfire or high wind dust events, um, there are, of course, other mechanisms that air agencies employ to get the word out to uh, um, the public on how they can protect themselves. So you know, you'll see a lot of things with like the Air Now Network or emergency episode plans that um, state and local agencies run to, um, you know, provide that kind of immediate term responsiveness and get the word out to the public. So it's a great question. Yeah. I mean, if you're breathing high levels of PM 2.5, that can have health effects. I guess, you know, in terms of regulatory decisions, we have to look at, you know, what they can address within their particular agency sphere and what's, you know, the there's criteria and processes for how exceptional events demonstrations are done. That's a, it's a big topic. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. Uh, next we have from Yusuf, uh, given requirements of the five-factor analysis, is any weight given to existing or established airsheds and boundaries? Yeah, I can tackle that one. Um, so Yusuf, we do consider those. Um, it's not it's not as weighted as um, air quality. Um, it's it's kind of more of a you know we we determine where the boundary is going to be based on the monitoring data, and then we kind of figure out the shape of that boundary, um, and that's where we kind of consider the jurisdictional boundary. So it's not as important. It, like um, we wouldn't use that to determine if an area is attainment or non attainment, but we might use it to you know. Um, include a little extra part of um, a, a county or um, what, whatever makes sense there. I So it, it, we do consider it, but it's not weighted as much as the um, other factors. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and lastly, it looks like we have one from uh, Doug again, uh, directed to Ryan. Uh, do PM particles typically only go from particle to vapor? Or can it go back from vapor to particle? Wildfire heat intensity, particle density relationship evaluated over space and time dispersal would be pretty cool. Yeah, it's a great, great chemistry question. And so my answer would be that, you know, gas to particle partitioning is a very dynamic process. It's it's always it always occurs both ways, right? So and that was actually if you go back to the the volatility slide that I showed, um, you know, as you, you know, increase the temperature, you know, the, it goes from the particle off, out, you know, out to the gas phase, or if you decrease the temperature, the opposite happens. You go from the gas phase back to the particle phase. And so there has been many, many studies of wildfires set up to look at organic aerosol formation over time. 
And so what they'll do is, you know, or what's observed is that you see a lot of secondary organic aerosol formation down of uh, down downwind as the, the the wildfire plume ages because, you know, it's you know, in in a lot of that initial condensation does happen right after it it goes away from the fire, but you also have a lot of other chemistry happening like oxidation, which will actually decrease the volatility of the molecules, causing them to kind of condense down onto the existing particles. And that basically drives up your PM mass, you know, the farther downwind you get. Great, all right, thank you, Ryan. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters today and for um, everybody attending. Looks like we have just hit the 1230 mark and we don't have any more questions in the Q&A, but if any come up after the webinar, please feel free to reach out to me directly. My email address is below. Um, we'll also be sharing the presentation with everybody who attended uh, via email afterwards, and there will be a recording of it on our YouTube channel as well. So be on the lookout for a follow-up email and uh, just want to thank everyone again for attending. Take care, guys. Have a nice week. Thank you all. Likewise, have a good week.